Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of our video dealing with the lab exercise radiometric dating. So at the end of the previous video, we had just been discussing how geologists uh, take crystals of minerals that we want to use for radiogenic dating and extract the concentrations of the parent and daughter isotopes. So now we actually have to look at how we're going to take that data and turn it into a numeric age. Now, there are essentially a couple of ways that we can take that information and produce a value for the age of our sample, and they're both listed here on the left. Now, I'm actually going to start with the second one because this is the more old fashioned way of doing it, and it's quite a brute force way of calculating the age of your sample. So, in this particular method, the old fashioned way, what you would do is you would take the concentration of the parent isotope that your mineral started with. And if you remember, we can calculate that by simply adding together the concentration of the parent and daughter isotope at the time that we analyze the crystal. So add those two numbers together, and that tells you how much of the parent isotope you initially began with. Now, then what you do is you take the concentration of the parent isotope at the time you analyze the crystal. So you know how much of the parent isotope you started with, you know how much of the parent isotope you have when you analyze the crystal, so then all you're going to do is you're going to calculate how many half lives were required to achieve that concentration of the parent isotope that you measured. So as you can see, in order to do this, you have to go in a step by step process. You have to do the same calculation multiple times until you eventually reach a solution that fits the data. So as you can see, it's a very labor intensive, very calculation intensive method of producing an age. Now, the other method that's used to produce an age is to produce a daughter parent isotope ratio. And this is the method that's used uh, in modern dating techniques. So just as it sounds, you're going to take the concentration of the daughter isotope and you're going to divide it by the concentration of the parent isotope. And the resulting ratio can then be used to date your sample. Now, Typically, when we date a mineral, we are normally only able to use one radiogenic isotope. So in those systems, you're going to have a situation where, let's say, uh, you have done rubidium strontium dating. So you're going to take your concentration of strontium, you're going to take your concentration of rubidium, and you're going to divide uh, strontium by rubidium, and that's going to give you your ratio. And then you're going to come over and you're going to use a graph that looks something like this. Now, in this case, this particular graph is set up for uranium-238 and lead-206. So let's imagine that we've taken our crystal, we've analyzed the amount of uranium, we've analyzed the amount of lead-206, and we've divided the lead-206 by uranium-238 to produce our ratio. And let's say that the ratio that we get is 0.16, 0 0.16. How are we going to use that information? Well, we're going to start over here on the y-axis, and then we're going to come horizontally off the y-axis until we hit this trend line. And this trend line is a calculated trend line. It's a, it's a best fit trend line, essentially uh, that allows you to match a uh, theoretical data to a age. And so this is a purely theoretical trend line, but we do use it for the purposes of dating. So we come from our ratio of 0 0.16 and we come over until we hit our trend line, at which point we drop vertically straight down to the x-axis to get our age. So for a ratio of about 0 0.16, the age of our sample is going to be about 0.9 billion years, so 900 million years old. Now, this is the method we use when we only have one radiogenic isotope that we are using to date the sample. However, in some cases, we can actually get quite lucky and we can actually be dealing with a mineral that allows us to use more than one dating method. And this is very, very common with the mineral zircon. Now, as we've already discussed, when a zircon crystal is growing, it will allow uranium into the crystal lattice. And this will be uranium-238 and uranium-235. So we have both the radiogenic isotopes of uranium present and so we can use both of those radiogenic isotopes to date the sample. And what we want to see when we use that information is we want to see both of those different dating methods produce the same age. 
And if that happens, we know that therefore the data is good. And in that, in those instances, we refer to the sample as concordant because both of the dates produced are concordant with one another. And as such, we know the data is good and we know the age is good. So how do we use systems where we have two different dating methods? So in order to do that, we use what's called a Concordia graph or a Concordia plot. So on the Concordia plot, this is the kind of thing we would use when dating a zircon. So you can see over here on the y-axis, we have uranium-238 going to lead-206. And over here on the x-axis, we have uranium-235 going to lead-207. And obviously, we are dividing the concentration of the daughter isotope by the concentration of the parent isotope. So how do, how do we use this information? Well, you can see on the graph, we also have this blue line here, okay? And this is the line of Concordia. And so what we want is we want our ratios to essentially meet at the same point on this line. And this is going to give us the age of our sample. So for argument's sake, let's say we have a zircon crystal, which we analyze, and it gives us a lead 206 uranium 238 ratio of 0.3. And it gives us a uh, lead 207 uranium 235 ratio of about 3.5. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come across from the y-axis from point 0.3. I'm going to come across and we're going to hit the line of Concordia there. And then we're going to start off down here and we're going to come up and we're going to hit the line of Concordia here. And it's going to give us an age of somewhere around 1.6 billion years old. And both of those ages agree with each other. And as such, we know the data that we collected is good. Therefore, it's concordant. And so we can trust the age of our sample. You will also notice on this graph, though, that in some cases, you can end up with points that fall off the trend line. They are not concordant. They are discordant. Now, this tells us that there's something wrong with the data. It could be an analytical issue, or in most cases, it's due to leakage. So leakage is to do with the crystal being taken above its closure temperature, and this leakage will introduce errors into the data. We come down here. Okay. So when we reach the closure temperature for our mineral what happens well below our closure temperature our mineral is considered to be a closed system nothing happens to it the amount of parent and daughter isotopes within the mineral does not change it does not lose any parent or daughter isotopes to the surrounding rock however when you take your crystal above its closure temperature it will then begin to lose or leak as we say in geology uh, isotopes into the surrounding rock and the majority of the isotopes that it will lose will be the daughter isotope and so during loss or leakage the amount of the daughter isotope is going to start dropping and this is obviously going to affect the age that you calculate now because the daughter isotopes that we're dealing with in the case of this graph here have different masses, it's going to affect how quickly or slowly they're lost due to leakage. So as you can see, we have one system here that produces lead 206, and we have one system here that produces lead 207. So when we take our zircon crystal above its closure temperature, it's going to start leaking both of the isotopes of lead into the surrounding rock. However, it will probably leak the lead 206 faster than the lead 207. And so once our crystal drops back down below its closure temperature, we then come along in a few million years time, we take the crystal, we analyze it, and when we analyze it, we get two completely different ages for the two different systems. So the uranium 238 and the uranium 235 systems will give us differing ages, and as such, when we plot the ratios produced on this graph, it will produce a point that falls off the line of Concordia. So we know we have bad data. We know something has happened to our sample that has affected it. So you're probably wondering, what are the closure temperatures for some of the common minerals that are used for radiometric dating? So if we drop down to this table here, you can see we have a range of minerals listed over here in the left-hand column and the preferred dating method for them in the middle column. And you can see we have some minerals that we've already touched on, like zircon, biotite, and hornblende. Now, 
Obviously, when you're dealing with a mineral, you want your closure temperature to be as high as possible because that reduces the chance of there having been leakage from the crystal. So if we look at the mineral titanite, this is a mineral that's uh, commonly used for uranium lead dating. It has a closure temperature of between 600 and 650 Celsius. This is a pretty high closure temperature. So there aren't a whole lot of geologic environments where you end up with temperatures that exceed 650 Celsius. So that means in a lot of instances, your titanite crystal will not have suffered leakage, and as such, it would be a good choice for dating your rock. In contrast, we have a mineral like biotite. So biotite has a closure temperature of 280 Celsius plus minus 40 Celsius. So that means the closure temperature can be anywhere between 240 and 320 degrees Celsius. Now that is quite low by geologic standards. You know, it's quite easy to reach those kinds of temperatures. So there is a reasonable chance that when you analyze a biotite crystal, you could, act, you could actually have gone above its closure temperature at some point and that will have affected the date. So a lot of care has to be taken in selecting the best possible crystals that you use for dating to reduce the chance of them having suffered some kind of leakage that's going to affect the date that you calculate. Okay, so how do we try and get around or at least reduce the chances of us you know, developing errors in our data set? So obviously the first way we're going to do that is we're gonna select the best possible rock containing the best possible crystals. And then we're going to be very, very selective about which crystals we analyze. So we are literally gonna separate out the crystals from the rock and they are going to be hand picked or you know, with the best examples being used for dating. Now, as we've already touched on, your crystals can suffer loss or leakage if they have gone above their closure temperature. So how do we try and reduce the effects of that kind of process when we analyze our minerals? So there's a couple of ways that we can go about this in order to try and reduce any possible loss or leakage from our crystal. So the first way that we can avoid it is by doing a point analysis. So if you remember, we have two different types of analysis we can use, point analysis and bulk analysis. So in bulk analysis, we're going to take the whole crystal and we're going to digest it in acid and then analyze the resulting solution. The problem with that is, is that when you digest the crystal in that acid, it's got not only going to ingest, uh, digest the parts that have suffered leakage, it's going to digest the parts that haven't suffered leakage. And so this means that when you analyze that solution, it's probably going to give you an incorrect age. Now, if you use point analysis, on the other hand, you can select a specific point of the crystal that you wish to analyze. So if we look at this image here, B, you can see we have a zircon crystal and you can see there's a, a shape right here. This is a laser ablation pit. So in this case, this particular zircon has actually been blasted by a laser. And where the laser has hit the zircon crystal, it's ablated, so it's essentially um, vaporized the zircon crystal along this line here. Now, the great thing about these kinds of methods is that by doing this, you can select exactly which part of the zircon crystal you want to analyze. So typically, when you look at how leakage is distributed around a crystal, you will very often find that if your crystal has gone above its closure temperature, the highest levels of leakage will be along the edge of the crystal and the lowest uh, degree of leakage will be in the center of the crystal. And so this means if you can selectively analyze a part of your crystal, you are typically always best sampling the center because that's going to give you the environment which is least likely to have suffered any kind of leakage. Now, another way that we can try and avoid errors due to leakage is by abrasion. So this says, okay, we accept that there is a possibility that the crystal that I'm analyzing could have suffered leakage. And if that happened, most of the leakage will have occurred along the boundary, the edge of the crystal. So what I'm going to do is I am going to simply destroy and get rid of the edge of the crystal. And then what I'm left with will be the core of the crystal, which is far less likely to have suffered leakage. 
Now, this abrasion, this removal of the outer edge of the crystal can be done in a couple of ways. It can be physical abrasion, which is literally when you put the zircons into a tumbler and tumble them around so they bang against each other, and that will result in the outer edges of the zircon crystals being chipped off. Uh, typically, though, in modern lab settings, what they actually use is an acid digestion. So your crystal will be taken and it will be dunked into acid for a period of time. That will then burn off the outer edge of the crystal, removing any edge that could have suffered leakage and just leaving the crystal core behind. And then that can be used for the analysis to work out the concentration of the parent and daughter isotope. So by using the process of abrasion, even if your crystal hasn't suffered any loss or leakage, it helps you to feel more confident about the data that you're using. Now, the one thing that I should point out about the abrasion of crystals is that depending on the mineral you're dealing with, it sometimes can't be applied. So for instance, you can use uh, zircon, apatite, titanite, even hornblende, by, uh, even hornblende or feldspar. They can all be abraded to remove the outer edges to try and improve the quality of your data. In contrast, minerals like biotite and muscovite, given their extremely low hardness, you can't really abrade them very efficiently. So you can't. it's not a process you can use for analyzing uh, biotite and muscovite. And so once again, it's a process where you have to be selective about the mineral you're analyzing to try and get the best chance of getting accurate data. So if you have a rock and it contains both zircon crystals and biotite, you're probably going to get the best data from the zircon crystals. So that's the one you should probably focus on. So based on the descriptions of point analysis and bulk analysis using abrasion that I've just given you, you've probably come to the conclusion that point analysis is the better method for reducing errors in your data. And this is a perfectly reasonable argument to come to because it allow, you know the method itself allows you to be very selective about what part of your crystal you actually analyze. There is, however, one consideration that trumps all others, cost. When it comes down to it, uh, point analyses are considerably more expensive in most instances when compared to a bulk analysis. So using a laser or an electron beam to blast your sample and selectively analyze a part of your mineral, yes, it allows you to be more selective, but it also is going to cost you more. In contrast, you can abrade your crystal, you can then run it through a bulk analysis and get your date for a much lower cost. So the majority of analysis that takes place for geochronology purposes is done using a acid abrasion followed by a bulk analysis. Now, another thing that we need to be careful about uh, in order to try and avoid errors in our data set is the degree to which the mineral of interest has been altered. So during alteration, typically what happens is our mineral will interact with something else causing a chemical change. And the most common cause of this is our mineral coming into contact with a hydrothermal fluid, hot water. And this will be particularly bad for minerals like the micas, so biotite and muscovite, and minerals like the feldspars, because they have a habit of reacting with hydrothermal fluids. Now, when a reaction like this occurs, it can lead to changes in the chemistry of the mineral, and this is obviously going to affect the amount of the parent and daughter isotope contained within the crystal, and if it changes them, it will lead to bad ages. So what geologists are going to do is when we look at our rock, we are going to first of all look at the rock itself, and we're going to say, right, does the rock show any signs of alteration? And then we're going to also focus in on the mineral of interest, and we're going to say, does this mineral show any signs of alteration? And if it does, what we're going to do is we're going to try and be very selective about the crystals we analyze, and we are going to try and use crystals that show the lowest degree of alteration. And then we're going to obviously do multiple analysis on multiple different crystals, and hopefully they will all give us the same age, and that will give us a you know, definitive age for our sample. In order to avoid issues with alteration, it's not uncommon for geologists to try and select minerals which are less likely to have suffered alteration which could affect the mineral chemistry. So a classic example of this would be something like a granite. There are going to be crystals of feldspar, there are going to be crystals of biotite, some crystals of titanite, some crystals of zircon. 
Now, we know that the biotite and the feldspar are more likely to have suffered chemical alteration. And so what geologists will typically do is we will go and select the crystals less likely to have suffered alteration. So we'll focus on the titanite and the zircon because they're going to give us the best bets when it comes to dating the sample. OK, so now let's move on to the lab exercise itself. Part one of the lab exercise is going to be dealing with changes in the uh, isotope concentrations of a sample as you progress from one half-life to another. So it's going to be primarily focusing on how the amount of the parent and daughter isotope will change as you progress through several half-lives. So if we look at the page, we can see we have a table here, which you will be filling out. Across the top of it, we have our half-lives, so 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Obviously, half-life zero is going to be when your mineral just finished forming before any radioactive decay has taken place yet. Now, coming down through on the vertical column, you can see we have the number of parent isotopes. We have the percentage of parent isotopes remaining. We have the number of daughter isotopes, the total number of isotopes, the daughter to parent isotope ratio, and the time since formation in millions of years. Now, in order to try and make things straightforward, there is actually a worked example on the next page. So for this particular worked example, you will notice a couple of things. The most important thing is up here in the top left of this worked example, you can see the half-life listed. All right. For any table like this, the half-life will be listed somewhere around. It will be listed above or below, but it will be there always keep an eye out for the value of the half-life now in this worked example the half-life is 150 million years in the example that you'll be actually doing the calculations for the half-life may not be 150 million years so make sure you take a minute and actually find the correct half-life for the calculations you're going to be doing now, in terms of the number of parent isotopes, in the worked example, we're starting off with 128 parent isotopes. Now, we know that as we progress between half-lives, the amount of the parent isotope is going to decrease by 50% each time. So at half-life 0, we have 128. At half-life 1, we're going to have half of 128, or 64. Between half-life 1 and half-life 2, we're going to have another 50% decrease. And so by half-life 2, we're going to have half the amount that we had at half-life 1. That's going to be 64 divided by 2. So you can see as you progress from half -life, progress between half-lives, all you're doing is you're taking the amount of the parent isotope in the previous half-life and then dividing it by 2. Now, in terms of the percentage of the parent isotope remaining, what you're going to do is you are going to start off by um, taking the amount of the parent isotope you have at that half-life. So for half-life one, it's 64 atoms of the parent isotope left. We also know, though, that we began initially with 128 isotopes of the uh, parent isotope. So that number listed up here. So in order to produce our percentage of parent isotopes remaining, what we're going to do is we're going to take the number of parent isotopes we have at that particular half-life. We're going to divide that by the number of parent isotopes we started with. And then that number is then going to be multiplied by 100. And that is going to give us the percentage of the parent isotopes remaining. In terms of calculating the number of daughter isotopes, it's simply going to be the number of parent isotopes we started with in the worked example, it's 128, minus the number of parent isotopes for that half-life. So for half-life 2, we can see that we have 32 parent isotopes remaining. So in order to calculate the number of daughter isotopes, it's going to be 128 minus 32, which is the number we have at half-life 2, is going to give us 96 atoms of the daughter isotope. Now, in terms of the number of total isotopes for each half-life, it's simply going to be the number of parent isotopes plus the number of daughter isotopes. And the thing you're going to notice is 
the number is consistent. It doesn't change because all we're doing is taking parent isotopes and converting them into daughter isotopes. We're not actually losing anything. Then we have the daughter to parent isotope ratio, relatively straightforward. Simply take the number of daughter isotopes and divide it by the number of parent isotopes. Done. The final thing is the age of your sample for each half-life. So as you can see at half-life zero, the age of our sample is zero because it's just formed. After one half-life, we know that 150 million years must have passed. How do we know that? Because it literally tells us above our table in this instance. It says the half-life is 150 million years. So we know that to get from half-life zero to half-life one has taken 150 million years. So at half-life one, we know our sample must be 150 million years old. Now to get from half-life one to half-life two, we know it's going to take another 150 million years. So for half-life two, the age is going to be the age at half-life one plus an additional 150 million years. So for half-life two, the age of our sample is now 300 million years. So you can see that every time you progress from one half-life to another, you just add an additional age for the half-life to the total from the previous half-life. So hopefully part uh, one should be relatively straightforward. You've got the worked example. If you have any issues, please email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can to help you out. Now, moving on to part two, we are going to be using uh, radiometric dating to actually produce some ages. In this case, we're going to be focus focusing primarily on using radiometric dating to actually calculate the age of a boundary and also calculate the age of a range for a particular fossil. So the data for part two is actually real world data. It's from Graptolite fossils from Scotland in the United Kingdom. So you, you can read all about it in the text that starts part two, but I'm just going to skip through that and I'm going to get straight to the information. So if we come down to the stratigraphic column that we have here, you can see there's quite a lot of stuff going on. So here's our stratigraphic column over here on the left, and you'll see there is a key over here at the bottom of the strat column telling you what each one of these different layers is made of. So you can see the majority of the column is this gray rock. This is shale, so it's a mud, muddy sedimentary rock. You can also see we have some beds of limestone picked out in blue. We have some sandstones in yellow, and we have some layers of tuff in this kind of peachy pink color. So if you remember, tuff is a volcanic igneous rock. Now, the great thing is, is because it's a volcanic igneous rock, it's going to contain minerals that we can date, most likely zircon. And so in this case, you can see we have several tough layers, T1 to T6, that we have dated using zircon dating. We also have two sandstone layers, S1 and S2, that have also been dated using zircon. Now, in between these layers, you can see we also have several layers of the shale, for, which are also labeled. So we have M1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., going all the way up to M15. So these are the layers from which we have taken our graptolite fossils. So how are we going to use this information? So to begin with, what we're going to do is we're going to define the ranges, ranges for each of these graptolite fossils. So you can see that I've actually already begun by plotting a couple of examples for you. So the first graptolite fossil we're dealing with here is uh, D uh, in, in tortoise. OK, so if you look at D in tortoise, where does it occur? Well, it occurs in layer M1, it occurs in layer M2, and it occurs in layer M3. So when we come down here to our diagram, you can see that for each of the layers, there's actually a dashed gray line marking out the position of each layer for you. So you are going to label your fossil at the top. So in this case, it's D uh, in tortoise. And then you're going to mark the locations where this fossil occurs. So we know it occurs in M1, M2, and M3. And then we're going to link these points together using a line. And that gives us the range for this particular fossil. The next fossil we're interested in is uh, D. Ramses. 
And so, uh, sorry, should I say Ramses. And so if you look at it, we can see it occurs in M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. So we're going to come down to our stratigraphic column again. We're going to label our fossil at the top, the Ramses. And then we are going to mark the position or the layers in which it occurs. M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. And we're going to draw a line linking those points together. And so once again, that's now giving us the range for that particular fossil. So what you're going to do is you're going to repeat that process for all of the fossils in this table. Okay, so as you can see, the next fossil is this one. So you can see it occurs in one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so when you mark it, you're going to put the fossil name at the top. And then you're going to mark it that it occurs in layer one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you're going to move on to the next fossil. And you should fill up the whole diagram. Each one of these columns can be used for an individual fossil. So just work through this list of data one fossil at a time until you've marked all the locations, all the layers in which each fossil is occurring. OK, so once we have that information, what are we going to do next? So by the time you finish, this diagram is going to be full of the ranges for each of the fossils. So once you've done that, the next uh, job is going to be to focus on actually using the uh, uranium lead data from each of the zircon crystals to date the layers of tuff and sandstone. So as you can see, for question two, we have a table of data, and these represent uh, lead 206 uranium 238 ratios for each layer. So this is layer T1. So if we just come up to our diagram here, Here's layer T1. It's a tough layer uh, situated between layer M3 and M4. So for this particular layer, we managed to extract eight zircon crystals, and these are the ratios for each of those crystals. So what you're going to do is you are going to produce a sample average. So you're going to take these eight ratios, you're going to add them all together, and then you're going to take that number and divide it by eight. In the case of layer T2, you can see they only got six crystals and the layer, and for layer T3, you can see they got seven. Okay, so you're just gonna produce an average for each one of these layers, T1 to T6 and S1 and S2. Now, there is a point that I just want to make clear right now. The layers T1 to T6, please give your sample average to five decimal places only, please. Don't do four, don't do six, Five. In the case of layer S1 and S2, you are going to give your answer to three decimal places only, not two, not four, three. The reason for that is it's going to make your life easier when you take this data and you apply it to these graphs. Because you'll notice in the case of graph A, you can see that it goes to two decimal places. So having three decimal places will allow you to work out where you fall in between these points on the y-axis. In the case of graph B, you can see that it goes to five decimal places. So having your answer to five decimal places will allow you to work out where you fall on the y-axis. So that's why I'm asking you to do this. Please do as I ask. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Now, once you've calculated your sample averages or your average uh, composition, should I say, for each of the layers, you are going to take that information and you are going to apply it onto these graphs. So you're going to take your sample average for T1, which you will have calculated to five decimal places. You will find your value. So let's just say, for argument's sake, your sample gives you an age of 0 0.07930. That's our ratio. So how are we going to use that information? Well, we're going, we know we're going to start off on our y-axis at that point. We're going to come across horizontally until we hit trend line. At that point, we're going to drop down vertically until we hit the x axis. And where we hit the x axis is going to be the age of our sample. So in this instance, the sample would be 44, uh, sorry, 443 million years old. So it's a relatively simple process. So 
what do you need to show me? Well, the first thing is, is I want to see the lines that you are drawing to get your ages. So I want to see you drawing the horizontal line from the y-axis. Then I want to see that vertical line from the trend line down to the x-axis to get the age. So I need to see those lines, please. Otherwise, you will be losing marks. The next thing is, is you will then write the age of your sample in this table. Please make sure when you're writing the age and you are writing it for the correct layer. All right. Occasionally, some people think this is T1, this is T2, this is T3, this is T4. And obviously, if you do that, you will lose marks. So please make sure you take a minute and keep track of which uh, layer you are producing an age for and write it in the correct box. OK, so once you've done that, what's the next step? So we're on to question four now. So for question four, the Ordovician Silurian boundary of the southern highlands of Scotland uh, is displayed by the appearance of the fossil assemblage, which contains these four different Graptolite fossils. OK, now that means if we are looking for this boundary in our sequence of rocks in our stratigraphic column, we know that the transition from the Ordovician to the Silurian occurs when these Four fossils all appear in the same layer. All right. When they first appear in the same layer, that is the boundary. All right. If you have three of the fossils in your three of those four fossils in your layer, that is not the boundary. If you have two of them, it is not the boundary. You must have all four of those fossils in your layer to denote where the Ordovician to Silurian boundary is located. Also, if you have several layers that contain these four fossils, the boundary will be marked by the first occurrence. So the lowest layer will mark the position of the boundary. All right. So on your diagram, you are going to have the ranges for each of the fossils drawn out at this point. And you're going to look for those four fossils and you're going to see, right, maybe, I don't know, M10. Maybe in layer M10, that's the first time all those four fossils occur together. That means layer M10 marks the position of the Ordovician Silurian boundary in southern Scotland. So this is us defining a boundary between geologic units using fossils. Now, the next question is, is, well, can we then apply an age to that boundary? How would we do that? So once we've located our boundary, what we can then do is we can look and we can see, are there any datable layers above and below our boundary that we can use to produce an age? So for question five, we're going to try and do just that. So let's head back up to our diagram here. So Let's imagine that when we find those four fossils, that the boundary is here. So for this case, we're going to say the boundary is M11. So for M11, we can see that below M11, we have layer T3. This is a layer of tuff. We have a numeric age for it from the uranium lead dating. Above it, we have layer T4. This is also a layer for which we have a numeric age. So how are we going to use that information to calculate an age for the boundary? What we're going to do is we're going to take the age for layer T3. We're going to add that to the age for T4, and then we're going to divide by two. Very straightforward. And that is going to give us the age of the Ordovician Silurian boundary, which as we know is M11. And so what you're going to do for that question is you are please going to make sure you show me your working. All right. If you don't show the working, you are going to lose marks and you are going to write your calculated age for the Ordovician Silurian boundary in this box right here. Now, the final uh, the two final questions are question six and question seven. So for question six, uh, in most cases, fossils do not have numeric ages associated with them. So we don't know exactly when a fossil existed in terms of solid numbers. But we can say things like it occurred in the early Devonian or it occurred in the late Permian, etc. That's the best we can do 
because most fossils have been dated in a relative fashion, so they're part of a sequence. However, in some circumstances, we can get lucky and we can have a fossil that has a range zone that falls between two datable units. So once again, we're going to actually, uh, sorry, we're going to look for one particular fossil. And this is the fossil that we are looking for. Okay. And this particular fossil is interesting because it has a datable unit below it and it has a datable unit above it. So on our diagram, we are going to say, right, where does that fossil occur? So let's say that that particular fossil occurs in layer M9 and M10. All right, it occurs in two layers. Well, we know below layer M9, we have layer T2, for which we have a date. Above layer M10, we have layer T3, for which we also have a date. We therefore know that this fossil, which only exists in these two layers, M9 and M10, must have an age range between T2 and T3. And so you can see in that particular instance, what we now have is we now have a fossil where we actually have a defined age range for it. So in future, if we go to any other place in the world and we see that fossil, we can say, brilliant, we know that rock is, and then we can give the age range. So we have a number. So like I say, for most fossils, we, don't, we aren't that lucky, but rarely that kind of thing does occur. And so when you write your answers, you are going to write that your fossil is clearly older than and younger than. So your fossil, so if we just come back up to our diagram here, we were looking at M9 and M10. So we know our fossil must be younger than whatever the age is for T2. And we know our fossil must be older than whatever the age is for T3. Relatively straightforward. The final question for this lab exercise is question seven. And that simply asks you, are the ages that you calculated for the eight layers, so that's T1 to T6, S1 and S2, consistent with the principle of superposition? Please explain your answer. So if you remember, the principle of superposition simply says, oldest layer at the bottom of a sequence, youngest layer at the top of a sequence. So if we look at our stratigraphic column here, if superposition is accurate m1 should be the oldest layer and whatever this layer up here should be the youngest layer now in terms of the layers for which we actually have dates you can see we've got t1 s1 t2 t3 t4 t5 s2 and s6 so if superposition is functioning correctly we should see the ages steadily getting younger as we work our way up through the stratigraphic column the question is do we see that if we see that, brilliant. Then in that case, the sequence follows the principle of superposition. However, if we have a situation where the ages don't do that, clearly something has happened. And if you find that, that situation has occurred for question seven, you are going to have to try and come up with an explanation as to why the sequence does not appear to follow the principle of superposition. Once again, if you have any question, uh, if you have any problems with this question, if you're trying to think of an explanation and you, and you just can't think of one, please send me an email. I will try and guide you towards the answer. I'm once again not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to try and guide you towards it. All right. Thank you for watching the videos, everybody, and have a good day.